I hope you're doing well. I've been feeling generally unequipped to exist and I hope you have more of a grip on your existence than I have on mine at any given time. But that's not why we're here. Vaginas. Vaginas is why we're here. I was scrolling on Instagram, as one does, and I saw a post of a beautiful woman and she was posing in a way that I don't even know how to describe. But she looked cute. And in the caption, she wrote an essay about how much she loves the smell of her vagina. And something about the way she went about it really intrigues me. It wasn't a, hey y'all, love your vagina or whatever post, which I'm totally fine with. But it was more like, a, this is my personal experience of me doing this particular thing at this particular time, how I think about this aspect of my body. And I thought it was interesting that she allowed us that much insight into her mind. And it made me think about the nature of privacy in today's culture. When people talk about privacy, they usually talk about data and how social media is selling ours to the highest bidder, which is of course very important. But I personally don't care as much about the CIA seeing me wank in front of a webcam as I do about psychological privacy. So today we're talking about psychological privacy in particular. We'll talk about the psychology of sharing, about why posts look the way they do today. Why does the post that I just told you about exist? Why do posts like this exist? Is it educational, inspirational, sensational? And how big of a role does gender play in how much we think should stay private? Anyway, I've read about it. I've thought about it. So let's just get stupidly detailed about it. Privacy. So the word private comes from the Latin word privatus, which means set aside or belonging to oneself. We've been talking about privacy since at least 384 years before Jesus was even a thing. Aristotle was the first one, or it was at least the first documented account of it, um, of the idea of public in a private sphere. The guy believed that some things just naturally belong to the private sphere, like family and others naturally belong to the public sphere and he considered this distinction a natural part of being human when the philosophers Locke and Hobbes came along in the 17th century they built a little further on that idea the difference is they made the private the place where people self-regulated and the public the place where the government was in charge and they also applied it to property Locke I think it was Locke yeah he believed that Everything is public, but we can have private property by combining our labor to it. And later in the 19th century, in the Victorian era, we started taking privacy so serious that the private became taboo. How you look to others was so important that it influenced so many aspects of your life. So everything that was about you or about your family business, you just kept to yourself. Over the course of history, it's safe to say that people universally accepted the idea of public and private as a universal truth. Nature, domesticity, ownership, and privacy have always been connected to each other, and it resulted in privacy becoming gendered. Because, of course, private is domestic and the domestic is female, so the private became female. It's also argued that privacy reinforces gender-based power structures and that it has always been weaponized against women as a way to hide their oppression. And this is where we're left in terms of the theory of privacy. The consensus is that there's not really a consensus. There are scholars who don't even believe in privacy. According to them, when we look at cases that violate privacy, they can be equally well explained by other violations, like the right to one's property or the right to oneself. And then there are some feminist scholars who say, fuck privacy altogether. Let's get rid of it. The only reason it exists is to screw with women. And then there are other feminist scholars who say, no, let's not get rid of privacy because it would make family units more vulnerable to governmental intrusion. Let's just make a new theory of privacy that belongs in this day and age and still gives people dominion about what happens in their own homes. I could end the spiel here and be like, fuck privacy, it's a social construct, but I mean, most things are, if not everything. Does that immediately invalidate them? No, right? That would be too easy. And I could also go the route of Vaginal smell lady is a vanguard, a revolutionary who understands how privacy has always been used to oppress women. But that would not explain why men are sharing their earwax irrigations on Maine now. Women used to be the bigger social media users, but men are catching up now. And everyone is just very eager to talk about their weekly gooch massages. So obviously there's something else at play. 
And of course, we didn't just go from traditional privacy to sharing that we love the smell of our orifices. You know, a lot happened between Aristotle and grab a bucket and a mop for my wet ass pussy. There have just been so many seismic shifts in the 20th century. Things like industrialization, urbanization, sexual revolution, redefined gender roles, going from a close-knit community to a fragmented society, increased connectivity and the transparency that came with that. All of those things have changed our perception or our idea of what belongs in the private sphere and what belongs in the public sphere. So we've been through a lot and all of us have been living outside of the domestic realm in one way or another. And that's great. But it looks to me like we never really reevaluated what privacy looks like outside of that domestic realm. The interesting thing is that humans do have a privacy instinct or a privacy intuition. And of course, the whole associating it with locations like the home or people like women is us just doing that thing where we take a thing that is an inherent truth to our humanity and twist it in such a way that corrupts it. But privacy is inherent to us. The most successful things in this world play into our base instincts. Things like reality TV, porn, celebrity culture, they all speak to a prehistoric need in us. Social media is no different. It's popular because it corrupts a system that's inherent to us, our brain's reward system. And likes and notifications really do make our brains light up like pinball machines. So much so that it might have overridden any privacy instinct we had. In its place, we developed a strategy called the privacy calculus effect, where we weigh the risks of sharing about ourselves with the potential rewards, things like intimate connection and external validation. A 2015 study showed that social media users tend to overestimate the positives or the rewards, and they tend to only focus on them, resulting in more self-disclosure than anyone is asking for. And this is how videos about mental breakdowns happen. And we like these things because no one likes to think of themselves as unsupportive or narrow-minded. So we enforce these behaviors by liking them. It's basically operant conditioning. We're teaching people to associate certain behavior with certain consequences. The behavior being posting something crazy and the consequence being getting attention for it. But Jill, what about spreading awareness? Isn't transparency good? Um, that's debatable. I think that more often than not, we're using creating awareness as an excuse to do too much. Exhibitionism and education are not the same, just like overexposure and vulnerability are not the same. If you post a video of your own mental breakdown, and I'm on mental breakdowns now because that's the last thing I saw, but if you do that, you create awareness for your mental breakdown, not mental breakdowns in general, just yours. And you do it for what is often really shallow validation because what are your followers realistically going to do for you other than send you hearts and call you brave. And when you share it, you've basically decided that the shallow validation is enough for you, that it's worth the social risk. I think spreading awareness is often most effective if there's a little bit of space between the subject and the person talking about it. And with space, I mean, you know, when you talk about it after your mental breakdown, or if you talk about the help you're getting at the moment or the steps you're taking to find help. You have to have at least a game plan or else it's just the blind leading the blind. And creating awareness without actionable steps is just, I don't know, an announcement? A way to get away with oversharing? Let's be honest, social media gives us all the impression that we should all be amazing individual human beings and that we're unique and that we all have to have something to say all the time. And the honest to God truth is that without oversharing, 90% of people online wouldn't have anything to say. And I think that's part of the problem. We should be okay with having nothing to say. Post that stack of pancakes. I love posts like that. And the fact that we've decided that everything needs to be profound seems to be at the core of internet dishonesty. I think a lot of people don't realize that the things we post online become performative by virtue of being posted online. And of course, this doesn't count for hidden camera footage, which of course is already crazy and shouldn't be okay. And 
I mean, can you imagine not having any dominion over your own image because everyone has a camera in their pocket? No wonder kids don't have an awkward stage anymore. I mean, you have one and then that picture will haunt you for the rest of your life. It's terrible, but what was I saying? But yes, when you film yourself crying, you have to upload it, you have to caption it, you've decided that you're a cute enough crier to post it online. You're basically your own publicist. How is that not performative? Just like how being a mad activist online is by virtue performative. Because usually people who follow you already agree with you, so you're basically preaching to the choir. And it's not like policymakers will look at your stories and be like, wow, you know what? Messy bitch 3000 might be up to something. I found a post from the Applied Ethics Center of UMass Boston. Uh, it's a university, and there's an ethics professor that explains how online activism is actually kind of dangerous. I'll post a link down below. It's worth it's worth the read. It's interesting. It's nuanced. It's it's an interesting read. I think where we went wrong is that we started conflating privacy with secrecy and shame. And I get it, for the longest time they were the same thing. But there's a really important difference between the two. Privacy is about maintaining healthy boundaries, and people who allow themselves privacy usually have a better sense of autonomy and self-respect and recover from setbacks better. Secrecy is about keeping something to yourself because you're afraid that if people find out about it, they won't accept it. So it's possible to have privacy without secrecy. For example, it's completely okay to have threesomes, not be ashamed about it, and keep it to yourself. Or on the internet, it seems like these things are mutually exclusive, that keeping quiet about it means shame, but that's, that's kind of simplistic, isn't it? We're human, we all wanna connect. That's basically what this whole experience is about. My problem is oversharing is weaponizing your vulnerability, where vulnerability is really about connecting. Oversharing is self-serving. And that's why it feels so manipulative. Brene Brown, the researcher that has been researching vulnerability for decades, has in her new book made a list of things you should keep into account the next time you post to check if you're oversharing or if it's something that people need to know. And I will put the questions down below, but there are questions like, why am I sharing this? What outcome am I hoping for? Is there an outcome, response or lack of response that will hurt my feelings? Am I trying to reach, hurt or connect with someone specifically? And is this the right way to do it? And an extra question that I came up with that I find important is have the people you're intending on sharing this with earned the right to know this about you? You could obviously say, well, gross, you know, I'm on social media for fun and I can't spend time on asking myself these questions. You and I both know that you spend at least 10 minutes on every caption and perfecting it. So you're already spending the time. You might as well spend the time on something that helps you understand yourself better and, you know, it might even help your mental health. And if you're like, well, Instagram is a fun thing and, uh, you know, you shouldn't overthink it. Maybe not, but a thought would be cute. I honestly feel like if something falls apart when you think about it longer than a second, then it probably shouldn't be there, right? With all of that being said, I have posted some backward shit in my life. I'm going to reopen my Facebook page and see if I can find some old, terrible oversharing messages and I'll put them in a video. <laughs> I've shared some terrible things in my life, like ridiculous things that no one should have known about. Luckily, I became aware of it a while ago, but yeah, just know that this is not me judging you. One of my values is just sincerity, not in a way that crosses boundaries or, you know, not in a preachy way, but I just want to make sure that the things I do and therefore the things I post come from a place of truth. I don't have to look like someone who has their life together because I don't. And I fully accept that everything I create reflects that. And, you know, reflects that confusion and uh, disappointment and joy and exhilaration and, you know, just the complexity of existence, of being human. I know I can do all that without describing the smell of my vagina. And look, like always, I'm not telling you what to do because I hardly know how to exist either. But. I think it's just an interesting exercise to next time when you open your social media to see if you can see the difference between creating awareness and oversharing. Would you recognize it if you did it yourself? See what conclusions you're left with. I um, was so inspired by that damn post, I couldn't help myself. I hope you liked it.
you can see all the searches down below. I used about 20. So I did a lot of reading, but I thought it was interesting. I'm not going to make any promises because I'm a very emotional creator in the sense that something really does have to make me want to talk about it. I'm not for saying something for the sake of saying something. If I have nothing to say, you won't hear me. You'll see me when you'll see me. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.